All right, good morning, Crossroads. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Happy Sunday. Great to gather as the body of Christ together to be expectant to what he's going to do this morning among us. We're so excited to do that with you this morning. Before we get to our singing, I have a very important announcement to make. Right in the middle of our Christmas season, as part of our 60 days of going and giving, we're having a Christmas concert. Unbelievable. It's going to be such a fun time together. We're very excited. And our very special guest artist, a Dove Award-winning artist, Linda Tate Randall, and her brother, whom you know from a little band called DC Talk, now frontman for Newsboys, Michael Tate will be here on this very stage, giving a Christmas concert, your favorite songs. It's going to be a great evening together. That's December 10th. It's a Friday night. Doors open at 5. The event starts at 6. Did I mention this is a free event? It's a free event, so invite your neighbors, invite your friends, invite your cousins, your Friday afternoon bridge group. Everybody's welcome, okay? Um, let me see. Uh, sign up online, and just to give you a little bit uh, more information, let's take a look at this video, and then we're going to stand and worship together. Let's take a look. Hey guys, what's up? I'm Michael Tate. Hey, and I'm Linda Tate Randall. My beautiful sister. We are together for Christmas again. Mike, where are we gonna be? Valencia, California. Valencia, California, Crossroads Community Church. But wait, it's not just any church, because there are two very special people that attend there. Our, our baby, baby sister, sister, Angela, yes. and then our brother in Your, love, our Rudy. Our superhero brother in law, yes. Rudy Neal. We so love you. we are so excited we get to come to your church. The date is December the 10th. We're happy tonight. Walking in a winter wonderland. Story time, my sister and I, stories of our youth, Christmas songs you love, you know. Tell your friends, it's gonna sell out fast. Please come. So click the link below for more information, for more details. Go to lindarandall.com, our bio, and you'll find everything you need there. Yeah. Get your ticket. Love you. Lots of fun with Mr. Snowman. Until the other kids knock him down. Awesome, you're not going to want to miss it. Be there on December 10th. Let's go ahead and stand together and let's worship our great God this morning. Oh. Come on, our Lord is working in our midst this morning. Let's sing this out. Win all. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. Yes, he does. You guys know it. When I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, and I'll sing through the night. Oh. God is full. 
Amen. Let's bow together. Jesus, we recognize that this morning. We feel that. We feel our weakness, Lord. We feel our frailty. We thank you, Lord, that uh, it's not of ourselves. That there's nothing in ourselves that um, could redeem. There's nothing in ourselves that um, could stand before a perfect, holy, righteous judge. There's nothing in ourselves that could um, make a life right. But it's only you, Jesus, Christ Jesus. Thank you, God, that your spirit was given to dwell within us, to change lives, change hearts. Thank you that your blood was poured out to cover the multitude of sins, to cleanse us from unrighteousness. We are wholly dependent on you this morning, Lord. Our strength is found in you. Our righteousness is found in you. And you clothe us in that righteousness, God. Thank you for your sacrifice. We celebrate that. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness that is upon us this morning. God, open our eyes to what you're doing. As we sing this next song, I just ask that you would do a great work to reveal that goodness. Give us thankful hearts. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this out. Let's sing our love right to him. I love you, Lord. the goodness of God. Come on, let's sing this together. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the good
good to worship. You guys can have a seat. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Ladies, what are you in pursuit of? If I was to ask you what your top 10 pursuits are, would wisdom make the list? Would growing in your walk with the Lord, knowing Christ deeper? If these resonate with you, please join us for the Pursuit Conference 2022. We'll be meeting on January 21st and 22nd, where Kelly Minter, who's an author and speaker, will be joining us and opening up God's Word and teaching us on the Sermon of the Mount. We'll have an awesome time in worship with Mandy Pinto and her band, and we'll have this opportunity to connect with other women here at Crossroads. Registration is open, so don't wait to register. Here's two reasons why. The first reason is that there's a discounted rate through December 31st. Students, we also have your back, so uh, we have a special rate for our students. Also, we expect this to be our best pursuit conference that we've had, and so signing up early really helps us to better prepare for the conference. Why not purchase two tickets and invite another person? See who the Lord puts on your heart to bring alongside to bring with you. As we pursue knowing our Lord, join us to be encouraged in your walk with Him to be further equipped in the truth of God's word, to have this sweet time of fellowship with sisters in Christ, and to start the new year in pursuit of our God. We hope to see you at Pursuit. Uh, wait, look this way, look this way. Look at, look at them all. Oh, there they are. Do you see how they were all clapping for me? Isn't that sweet of them? They were excited to see me this morning, Cal. So is my pal Cal. And uh, he's, all of, uh, he's all of three months. And uh, he's nothing but pure joy. Came to church today. Check out the girls in the nursery. And uh, uh, he's just a bundle of fun. And I wanted to, uh, I haven't had a chance to officially introduce him. Uh, to you all, and so this is uh, this is my grandson uh, Cal, and uh, we we love him the pieces. That's a great trade. You trade grandson for Bible, Bible for grandson. I mean, it's it's a win-win trade, no matter how you look at it. Well, good morning, Crossroads. Uh, sorry, I just, I, I wanted to do that, and, uh, and I'm the pastor, so I did it, and, uh, and uh, it was, uh, it's, 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 it's so much fun. If I, if I knew grandkids were this much fun, I would have started with them, and uh, um, that's kind of how I feel, and uh, you saw, uh, back to what's going on here at church, you saw... Um, uh, Lorene uh, share with us um, the whole uh, Pursuit Conference. And ladies, I just can't encourage you enough to get there. It's going to be a great conference. It is every year, but this year is shaping up to be a, a great year. Uh, and Kelly Minter is going to bring the word uh, in a very powerful way. And so I, I want to challenge the guys in this room. Um, send your ladies uh, to the Pursuit Conference. And so, you know, we'll talk about the ladies signing up in the coming weeks, but uh, this morning I want to challenge the men. Uh, get your ladies to the Pursuit Conference, all right? And uh, do whatever you can. Watch the kids. 
uh, take care of whatever needs to be taken care of and get them uh, to the Pursuit Conference because you'll, you'll be really blessed uh, by uh, their attendance. And so I encourage us men to support our, our ladies in that. Uh, I want to give you a quick update on, on, on giving, financial giving. We're in this uh, 60 days of going and giving, so we're at week two. You'll see up on the screen. Uh, week two, uh, the giving was another crazy number, $99,000, which is just unbelievable. We had a, we've exhausted the matching fund. You'll see that next. The matching fund is now exhausted at uh, a total of $200,000, but sixty five dollars for this week, because that was all that was left. That brings a grand total, you'll see at the bottom, for uh, both weeks, for a grand total of over $433,000. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, you'll notice the math on that, 20% of that's going right to go. So we have $86,000 already set aside for all things go, for our, our go aspect uh, uh, as part of this series. And so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity. Uh, get involved, join us if you haven't joined us. Uh, keep joining us if you have, and let's just see what God does and uh, see what um, the Lord uh, does through his people. Uh, grab your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of... First Thessalonians, as we are in this series of going and giving, uh, we're going to be in the book of First Thessalonians. As you turn there this morning, let me say a quick word of prayer for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you uh, for um, every word that you have placed in your scriptures. And uh, Father, as we approach uh, Thanksgiving, help us to, to understand um, this whole issue of gratitude in a a deeper, richer way, and may it be authentic, may it not be manufactured, but may it be uh, something that bubbles up from our hearts. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless our time in your word. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 This morning, I want to talk to you about giving, about giving. And you say, Pastor, you already talked about giving. You're done talking about giving. Move on past the topic of giving. Well, so I want to speak to something about, um, about which is much harder to give than money. Much harder to give than money. Uh, giving uh, here at the church is relatively easy with an app. You can just click a button and you can give a buck. I want to talk to you about something that's very difficult to give. Sometimes uh, for some of us in certain situations, it's impossible for us to give. And that is that of giving thanks, of giving thanks like a, a wild animal that is caged, to be thankful is also not natural. It's not part of human nature. Babies are not born uh, out of the womb, uh, coming bearing little gifts from Nordstrom, saying, thank you so much for these past nine months, and I look forward to spending the rest of my life with you as parents. That is not the uh, normative way uh, we kind of get our start here on the planet. Uh, in, in fact, you don't even have to teach your kids to be ungrateful. It seems that they can do it without any education whatsoever. Um, it's, a, it's a learned behavior. Uh, it's, it's something that God grows in us, the idea of being grateful, of being thankful. But, but when it comes down to, I want to be grateful, I want to be thankful, and what does it actually look like, and how do I actually do it, that's where we begin to stumble. When you think about it, how do you be thankful in the sense of how do you, how do you just actually just do it? In other words, let's, let's do a little practice here this morning. We're all going to be very thankful in just a moment. And so I want you, on the count of three, to be extremely grateful, extremely thankful. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. Yeah, we, yeah, that was weak, except for the gentleman right there. He's extremely grateful this morning. Um, it's really difficult on command to be grateful. It seems that it has to, it has to actually sneak up on you like raisins do. And, and so the, the, this, morning, this morning, what I want us to think about is, is if, if, if this thing called gratitude is supposed to be part of our lives, and you're going to see it is, it is then, then how do I actually do it? Or more importantly, why do I do it? If we can understand the why, then maybe we can get our, eye, our arms around how to actually be this person of great gratitude. Well, Paul writes this interesting letter, and he writes it to this almost all-Gentile church in Thessaloniki. Uh, and, and he writes to them, and he gets to chapter 5, and he's beginning to wind down his letter. 
And uh, he's been writing this letter to this Gentile church for a reason. And the reason is really found in chapter 4, verse 1. Look at it with me in 1 Thessalonians. He says this. He says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus uh, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and, what's the word? More. He's trying to encourage them in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ to be pleasing to him. And he's asking and encouraging them to do it more and more. And so he comes to the very end of his letter in chapter 5, and he starts firing off in rapid fire, kind of sequential order here, of things that they can do to please the Lord more and more. And we, get, we find ourselves where we're going to kind of just uh, kind of narrow in on is verse, uh, verse 18 of chapter 5. And one of the things he says to them, he gives them an imperative command. And here's what he says, verse 18. He says, give thanks in all circumstances for this, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, if you're like me, uh, and maybe the people in the church when they first received this letter, oh boy, another thing for me to do. Put it on the list of things that I need to do to demonstrate my sanctification. And so we try to rev ourselves up and become this kind of, um, well, artificial or formica, I would call it, thankfulness. That's really, really not the real deal, but it's really uh, just off our lips, and Paul's going to drive at this point that he doesn't want thankfulness and gratitude just to, to drip off our lips. He wants it to flow from our hearts where it's authentic and genuine. And it's the real deal. And, and, and basically, he's going to help us see in this verse really the why he wants us to be thankful. In essence, he's going to help us understand why God himself desires that his followers, his kids... Uh, they become uh, grateful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we can understand why, we, we begin to embrace this idea of gratitude. And this morning, I want to propose something to you, a novel thought. And that is simply this. What if thankfulness, thankfulness was, was actually a blessing and not a burden? What if uh, thankfulness, from God's perspective, is something that he didn't want from you, he wants something for you? What if this whole idea of gratitude has a, has, a, has a real benefit in the lives of a believer, and maybe that's why God has commanded thankfulness? And so this morning, I want us to take a deep dive just on this one verse, verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians 5, and I want us to look at three things. I want us to first see the command that he gives to us. I then want to look at the cause, the reason that we should do this. And then lastly, I want to look at the circumstances in which we should practice this. So if you're taking notes, right at the top of your notes, the very first one, let's just get our arms around this thing called the command. What is he actually commanding here? Well, it's very easy. You don't have to be a, you don't have to be a highly educated person in the room to understand what Paul is asking for. Verse 18, he says this, give thanks. And so his command is really clear. The command from the Lord Jesus Christ is really clear. Christ follower, Crossroadian, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This imperative command is really just one Greek word. Uh, the one Greek word is eucharisto, and eucharisto is this idea of giving thanks. It's actually two Greek words, boom, kissed together, compound Greek, and it has the idea of good and grace. If you were to translate it just in the raw, it would be good grace. Uh, in other words, when we say thanks at uh, the table before we eat, in many families, somebody will say, who wants to say grace tonight? That's where it comes from. It's good grace. It's God's good grace on us. And that should, uh, that should elicit this heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. You see, thankfulness in the Christian life, thankfulness is the residue of a Christian life. It is the byproduct of a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-walking Christian. When you are lacking and leaking thankfulness, you are not on track with the Savior. And so this morning, I want you to understand that the command is an imperative command. It's not a casual command. And remember, uh, we, uh, the scriptures don't have to command what's natural. Have you noticed that? You don't have to command what's natural. You'll never see a Greek imperative command that says, be lazy. 
That, you'll never see that. Why? Because that's just our natural drift. That's just our natural reaction. Uh, what, what you see here is an imperative command to do something that is supernatural. And this idea of giving thanks, in fact, is sprinkled, is sprinkled into many of the Pauline epistles. Just like bacon bits are sprinkled across the salad, give thanks is sprinkled all throughout Paul's letters. Just to give you a taste, Ephesians 5, give thanks always and for everything. He writes to the church of Philippi, Philippians 4, 6, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. He writes to the church of Colossae, Colossians 2, 7. He says, I want you to be abounding. That word abounding is to gush or to burst. Have you ever hit a fire hydrant? Don't raise your hand. But here's the reality. If you do, you hit the fire hydrant, and you know what happens. The water just starts to kind of trickle out. No, he just comes bursting out. It comes gushing out. That's what he says, Colossians 2, 7. I want you to burst out with thanksgiving. And then he tells young Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 4. He says, I want you to be a, a man of God who receives God's good gifts, his good grace gifts with thankfulness, Timothy. And, and that's just a smattering of, of, of the phrases throughout some of Paul's letters. And so the question is, why, why so much thanksgiving in the scripture? Well, again, it's because Scripture has to command what's not natural. And Scripture has to be part of our sanctification process. And Scripture has to inform our sanctification process. That we say to the Spirit of God, I'm not really, I'm not really thankful right now. In fact, I'm really, well, I'm ticked off right now. Lord, Lord, reign and rule of my spirit and cause a seed of gratitude to rise up in me. For some of you here this morning, that's exactly where you're at. And you're approaching Thanksgiving, and you're thinking it's some conspiracy of Hallmark. And, 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 and you're like, oh, now we just got to be thankful. I, I don't want you to be thankful because you got to be thankful. I want you to be thankful because you are thankful. And Paul does too. And he says, I want you to understand and embrace this thing called Thanksgiving, about gratitude. You see, with the absence of Thanksgiving, here's the problem that's when joy fades. If you don't live a life of gratitude and thanksgiving, that's where joy fades. That's why Paul commands it. That's why he says, give thanks. Why? Because it's, it's, it's God's design for us. In fact, when we are thankless, that's when joy begins to slip away. We're going to go through the book of Ecclesiastes uh, after the first of the year. And um, uh, when we do, uh, we're going to see the wisdom of Solomon. One of the things Solomon writes in his journal is Ecclesiastes 5, verse 20. And he talks about a man, he talks about a man that God is empowered with thankfulness. And what he says of him, listen to, just listen to the verse. In Ecclesiastes 5, 20, here's what he says. This man is a man who will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. Don't you love that? Uh, here's a man, here's a man who's being uh, occupied 24-7, 365 with the gladness of his heart. And if you do a study in chapter 5, you'll all find out why, why does he have gladness in his heart? It's because he's a, he's a thankful man. So this man is not sitting there always taking his age and uh, doing uh, that against the insurance tables of how long he has left. He's always just busy. He's busy with the gladness of his heart that he constantly is remembering the kindness and the goodness of the Lord. And what happens is his attitude of gratitude begins, begins to bubble up and then burst forth this thing called joy. And so Paul says, I want you to get a handle on the command. Why? Because, because the command is for your good. And we're going to see that played out. How do we see it played out? Let's look at the cause. What's the reason that he gives that command? What's the cause for our thanksgiving? Well, notice about verse, verse 18, he continues on, give thanks in all circumstances for purpose clause. You ready? Here's the purpose. Here's why he says it. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. <laughs> you see that? It's very clear. Paul doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, lay down foggy words. He's very clear on this. The reason, the reason I want you to give thanks, and the Spirit of God is inspiring me to put this on print, is because it's actually the very will of God for you, for those that are in Christ Jesus. The cause for which we express gratitude is the will of God. Notice how he puts it. He says, for this 
For this is the will of God, and you have to to ask yourself, what is this? This is a direct uh, uh, reference right back to not only thankfulness, but if you look at verses uh, 16 and 17, he has two other things. It's a, it's a triplet of things. He first says, I want you to, I want you to be uh, uh, prayerful. I want you to always be praying. Uh, and, and, then, and then he says, where, where am I? Uh, verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 16, rejoice always. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. There I am. So he gives this triplet command, and the third one is thanksgiving, and he says, for this, all three of those, we're looking at thanksgiving, but it's a reference to all three. He says, this is the will of God for you. This is not all the will of God for you, but this is a portion of the will of God for you. Now, you have to understand that when we see this is the will of God, this becomes muy, muy importante to us as Christ followers. And the reason it's muy, muy importante is because we as Christ followers should be on a constant seek and search for the will of God in our lives. If you notice, it's best to get on God's plan as soon as you can. Like I always say, I've seen his baseball card, a billion wins, zero losses. Get on, get on board with his will for you. And so there's this, always this rabid search of a Christian trying to figure out what, what's God's will for us. And we, we act like it's some uh, hidden Easter egg and we go hunting for it all kinds of places. And hey, you know, should I buy a Honda or should I buy a Toyota? And I often say, I'm not sure the Lord really cares. So buy a Honda. And <laughs> the, the, the reality is... Um, When we get told something is the will of God, that should become seriously, significantly important to us because we're always in search of it, are we not? In fact, he tells us another thing it is the will of God. Look back in chapter four. He says in in 1 1 Thessalonians 4, verse three, he says this, for this is the will of God. Oh my goodness, I've been searching for it. What is it? He says, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So he says, you want to know the will of God? Here we are, chapter 4, chapter 5. He's telling us the very plain will of God. And loved ones, as a pastor, I hear this all the time. People ask me, Pastor, how do I find out the will of God? How do I find out the will of God? Well, let me tell you how you find out the future will of God is start doing the present will of God. Right? You can't find out the future will of God until you're doing the present will of God and, and, and things like what? Your sanctification is the will of God. Uh, your thanksgiving is the will of God. Remember Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give what? Desires of your heart. I always thought that was a Christmas verse. <laughs> so right before two weeks before Christmas, Pastor Todd was a kid, started delighting himself in the Lord. So I would get the desires of my heart on the 25th. And then I realized that's not what the verse means. What he says there in Psalm 37, he says, delight yourself in the Lord. In other words, what? Do the present will of God. Pursue sanctification. Be a man and woman of thanksgiving, of gratitude, always thanking the Lord for his good grace on your life. And then it says this, the the psalmist says, and and then he he will give, but the word is actually plant. He will plant his desires in your heart. So as you're doing the present will of God, trying to figure out the future will of God, all of a sudden, he puts these desires in your heart. And you go, I think I want to buy a, I think I want to buy a Honda. Oh, where'd that come from? He planted desires in your heart. So what do we say? Go buy a Honda. Oh, I'm trying to figure out if I should stay here in California or if I should move. From your pastor, it's, it's stay, just so you know. <laughs> but if God wants to overrule that, what you got to do is delight yourself in the Lord. Do the present will of God. And then he will plant his desires in your heart. If that's a desire of your heart after you are practicing the will of God in your life, then the Lord says, go ahead and do it. Why? Because the father loves to say yes to his kids. What father doesn't like to say yes to his kids? So what does he do? He plants his desire in your heart. You say, Father, I I really want to do X. I really want to go to to this place. I really want to make this decision. I want to take this job. And the father says, that's great. The answer is yes. Where'd that that desire come from? It came from the heart of God himself. So Paul says very clearly, this is really important. Why? Because this is the will of God for your life. 
If we see, well, if we see that, that God's, will, God's will is for us to be grateful and, th- and thankful, we have to ask ourselves, why does he will that? Why does he will that? Well, now we're back to the thing I said at the beginning of the message. What if God wanted something, not from you, but he wanted something for you in this gratitude thing? Let me ask this question. You're, you're, you're Bible students. You come at 9 o'clock. And so let me ask this question. You, you, you Bible students out there, is God's will for a believer, is God's will against a believer or for a believer? For. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, good, because that's the right answer. It's always for us. God is an omnibenevolent God. He wants all things for us. He's not against us. He's for us. Romans 8, who can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can. So his will is always for us. If his will is always for us, then there must be some sort of blessing in it because he never wants something bad for us. See, let me say it this way. God's not insecure sitting up there going, when is Pastor Todd going to be grateful? God's not up there sitting insecure waiting for us to say thank you. What God is actually doing is he says, I want something for you, not from you. And if you have a heart of gratitude, here's, here's, what, here's what happens. There's something that good that happens to you. There's something that happens in your life supernaturally. There's something that happens in your life even physically. <laughs> it's one of the things I love. I love when, when science finally catches up with the Bible. Science is so far behind the curve. I mean, the Bible has, has nailed science uh, for many millennia, and we're just now catching up with the Bible when it comes to scientific things. You, you've read as much as I have. There, there has been a uh, overwhelming, a, um, just a plethora of articles these days about the whole benefit of gratitude in a person's life, the whole idea of thankfulness in a person's life. Remember, uh, Proverbs talks about joy is a medicine to the soul. Uh, laughter is a medicine to the soul. Well, we, there's something about this idea of laughter, joy, and thankfulness that is medicine to our soul. And, and we, as a culture, scientifically, are just figuring this out, that there's a benefit to us in, in our physical bodies. Let me just share with you for a moment just how thankfulness and how gratitude affects our brain. It literally changes the molecule structure of the brain, literally rewiring your brain. If you're sitting next to somebody that you would like to, God Almighty to rewire their brain, you better help them be thankful because God will do it. Why? Because it literally, it literally begins to rewire our brain. We know that it increases the gray matter, which is associated with better cognitive functioning. We know that gratitude affects the limbic nervous system in ways that regulate our emotions, helping us to steer clear of toxic ones. We know that Thanksgiving boosts neurotransmitter serotonin and it stimulates the brainstem to produce dopamine. You know what dopamine is? Dopamine is the little cookie your brain gives you when you do something good, okay? And whenever you, whenever you feel like, oh, that feels so great, you just got a little shot of dopamine. What does thankfulness do to the body? It causes the brainstem to give you a little shot of dopamine. You know something? God really knows his stuff. It's almost like he made us. <laughs> God's not sitting up there insecure waiting for us to be grateful. He's wanting us to experience something. The attitude and lifestyle of, of gratitude. Lastly, it enhances the activity in two primary regions of the brain. The anterior uh, cingulate cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex. The area is associated with empathy, decision-making, impulse control, and willpower. Those are rather important. What affects those? The attitude, the lifestyle, the practice of gratefulness. Thankfulness reduces anxiety, manages stress, improves sleep, and builds the immune system. Why would, why would we give thanks as a Christ follower? First and foremost, we have so much to be thankful for. Number two, God has told us to be grateful. Number three, we even see benefits on a physical level. One, some, of you, some of you are um, caught in the net of, a, uh, let's just call it a mild depression. Let's call it a, a high-level discouragement. Let me, let me just tell you, one of the greatest things you can do on a daily basis is to have a gratitude list going and every day write down five to ten things that you are grateful for for that day, even if it is this very next breath. Because there's something in us that God has wired us to experience something when we are grateful and thankful. 
So that's all really clear. You, you, see, you see the command. I even see the cause. It's for the will of God. Now I need to figure out when am I supposed to be thankful and when, sh- when should I not be thankful? What are the circumstances for thankfulness? So I'm hoping Paul's going to really narrow this down to just a very small thing on Tuesday afternoons. That's not what he does, though. Look at it. The circumstances. He says, give thanks in all circumstances. Um, He doesn't say give thanks in most circumstances. He doesn't say give thanks in the good circumstances. Uh, He says, give thanks in all circumstances. You know what all means in Greek? All. All the time. So that means the good, the bad, and the ugly of life. What am I supposed to do in the good, bad, and ugly of life? I'm to give thanks. What are the circumstances, Paul says? They're they're all kinds. Now, when I first read that, I was like, well, I think we must have had a misinterpretation because there's no way that's possible, right? I mean, if Paul's saying give thanks in, in the good and the bad and the ugly times, he might have well said, hey, Todd, I want you to climb Mount Everest in Bermuda shorts and flip-flops because it ain't going to happen, right? How, do I, how am I thankful, grateful in all circumstances? Sure, good circumstances, not a problem, Lord. I, in fact, I don't even need the Spirit of God to be grateful at that moment. But that's not what Paul says here. In fact, we, we tend to mitigate the bad circumstances in our life because they're bad. And we don't like pain, right? Have you ever seen the... the uh, the aspirin aisle in a, in, in a drugstore? How many versions of aspirin can there be? And then they have regular strength and extra strength, which doesn't make any sense to me. If I have a headache, what do you want it, to go away slowly? <laughs> take the regular strength. You want it to go away fast? Take the extra strength. Are you calling me stupid? <laughs> of course I wanted to take the extra strength. Why? I don't want the pain. I don't want the ugly. But what if there was purpose in pain? What if God was doing something in the puddles of pain? You see, we like the good. We're not necessarily always thankful for the bad. In fact, when we get married, we have those vows, do we not? I told you before, I love doing weddings because I just love standing right there with that beautiful princess and the ape over here. And and I'm always smiling, and they're always like, you're smiling because they look so cute. I'm like, no, I'm smiling because they don't have a clue what they're doing. And I'm actually got the giggles on the inside of like, you have no idea what you're in for. (laughs) But maybe you set them at your wedding, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health. You see, when Pastor Todd got married to Stacy, I got married for better, for richer, and for health. (laughs) Right? But that's not life, is it? Life has poor sickness and um, worse, I guess. Yeah, worse or poor, worse, Todd. The qualifier that Paul lays down, watch this, loved ones. The qualifier that Paul lays down is in all circumstances. Celebration circumstances, calm circumstances, confusing circumstances crushing circumstances. But notice something very clear that you have to, I have to point out to you. Notice what Paul says and doesn't say. Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. He doesn't say, give thanks for all circumstances. Which I'm really glad at, because if I, if, I, if, I if I didn't think about that, it'd be like, oh, okay, Lord, thanks for the chemo. Really, that's what I'm thankful for? Like, really, 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 really? No, he understands that this life will kick your teeth in, and he knows that some of those circumstances are crushing circumstances. And he says, but here's here's what I want you to understand. It's my will for you, even in those circumstances, for you to offer thanksgiving, not because I'm insecure and I want something from you. I want something for you in that moment. Now, this isn't bumper sticker theology. This is the word of God. And the reality is that our theology, at some point, the rubber meets the road. And I've been, I can't help but just be accosted by this for all circumstances. Because in the last 60 days here at Crossroads, we have absorbed 
five widows into our church. And I can't help but be, as I've sat with, with uh, four of them, to be, able to be able to think through this verse, for in all circumstances give thanks. And I started to ask myself, Todd, is, are you just going to preach a bumper sticker message or are you going to help us understand what Paul's driving at, this is the will of God? And I came to the place that I got to understand something. Why in the world would I, why in the world would I say to somebody in the most crushing circumstances, I want you to look for the things that give gratitude and gratefulness to God in? Because that's what the scripture says. But why would I do that? And I came down to really this understanding of God's providence. But one of the reasons it's the will of God for us to give thanks, giving, even in the crushing circumstances, is for us to step back and to understand that maybe the only thing, literally the only thing that I can be thankful for is that God's providential hand is at work. I don't enjoy. I don't enjoy it. It's no fun. It hurts. But I trust that God's providential hand is at work in this moment. So I started reading John Piper's uh, book called Providence. And I, I read it at night, so I have a reason to sleep. It's, it's a... It's a thousand pages on the providence of God. It, it, is, it is a masterpiece on this topic. And um, early on in the book, Piper does something for me that was really helpful. And he explains something that, to me that you guys have probably already know. So this is not going to be new to you. It's new to me. Is he helped me understand the distinction between God's providence and God's sovereignty. Because we've heard both of those words, and we use them somewhat interchangeably. Oh, God's provident, uh, providential hand is over that. Well, God's sovereignty reigns over that. And we use them somewhat interchangeably, but he defines the terms differently. Here's how he does it. You'll see up on the screen. Piper explains, and I love this, that God's sovereignty is God's power. He does as he pleases, the scripture says. He can do all things, the scripture says. That's his power. His ability, his sovereignty is over all things. It's over natural law. It's over the entire universe. It's over all of creation. He is a sovereign power over all things. But then he explains God's providence this way. God's providence is God's purpose. That not only is he all powerful, but he's all purposeful. That his providential hand is not just the statement of his power, but his providential hand is the statement of his purpose. I love, I love, I love how he defines those. And he actually goes back to uh, some of the catechisms that you may have learned, even some of you growing up in a particular denomination. The Westminster uh, Catechism of 1646 is probably the most expansive of God's providence. In chapter 5 of Providence, here's what it says. You'll see it on the screen. Here's how the Westminster Confession uh, basically describes God's providence. God, the great creator of all things, does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. What's interesting here is the Westminster Confession describes not only God's sovereignty as power, but it describes that he has purpose in all that he's doing. How in the world, Pastor Todd, do I give thanks in the midst of crushing circumstances? Oh, it's not for, it's not for the crushing circumstances. We're, we're, we're not just kind of there, just we love pain. No, it's my confession of my mouth that I am grateful, Lord, that in the midst of this crushing situation that you're bringing forth your eternal plan. You're bringing forth glory and honor to yourself. 
I don't see it now, but I, I know you have a purpose, and I know you will reveal your will someday to me, and it may be as I'm standing on the streets of heaven. And I'll look back, and I'll say, oh, oh, I get it. For that is the only thing that you can be thankful for at times when life is crushing you down, is that our good God is still at work. He's not silent. He's actually saying there is purpose. There's purpose in pain. So if you're like me, it was like, I got to take it one step farther because it still sounds like bumper sticker theology. Be thankful always in all circumstances. And now there's purpose in pain. That sounds like another bumper sticker. So what's God's purpose for our life? What's the purpose he's doing? Because I need to know what that is if that's what I'm going to be thankful for. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. You know, I want to, everybody turn there because you're going to need to be there. You need to see this with your own eyes. Even, even though you go, I know the verse, I know the verse. That's great. That's great, a little Awana cubby, you know the verse. In Romans chapter 8, Paul is explaining really what does it mean to be in the family of God. In Romans chapter 8, he begins to he begins to lay out some of the deepest wisdom of the wisdom of God. And I want to start us in verse 26 of Romans 8. Notice what he says. He says, "Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness." For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. It's up there for a moment. Anybody relate to that one? You're in a situation, you're in a life circumstance. I don't even, Lord, I don't even know how to pray. I'm so crushed by this. The good news, the comfort, the comfort of Scripture. Notice this. The rest of verse 26. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according, according to the will of God. Isn't that great? You're in a crushing circumstances and you don't even know how to pray. That's okay. You just start praying. You just start pouring your heart out to God. I don't know. I might say something wrong. You're not going to say something wrong. God has big shoulders and thick skin. Trust me. Ask Job. You just start pouring your heart out of God, but in, and you just trust the Spirit of God is interceding for you. Saying, you know what, Father, the, the, uh, he or she, man, the, they're going through it, and it really, you know, they, they say they need this, but you know what, Father, what they really need is this. That's what they really need. That's what they're trying to say, Father. She just doesn't even know how to say it, Father. But let me, let me say it on behalf of her. Isn't that awesome? That God not only hears our prayers, but he intercedes with them and prays what we actually need. Then verse 28, the famous verse. Notice how he starts it. And we know, which is a great contrast because in verse 26, we do not know how to pray. But now he says, here's something you do know. He says in verse 28, now we know, we know. That for those who love God, all things work together for good. A couple points on this. Don't, 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 don't quit on me here, church. Stay with me for this. This Number one, this promise is, is not true for everyone. This promise is for those who love God, who have a relationship with Christ, that are in Christ. And notice this. He says, uh, he, 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 doesn't say um, he doesn't say most things. But he says, all things work together for good. You know what the all things include? It includes the crushing things, the confusing things. He's using the all things in my life for this good. He doesn't say, and I just want to point this out, what he doesn't say, he doesn't say that all things are good. But he says, I will take the all things and I will bring about good in them for those that love me. Notice what he, what he does here. He says, I'm going to use the crushing circumstance. Really? Really? Yeah, really. He's going to take the crushing circumstance and he's going to use it in our lives. God uses pain and suffering and trials like a tool on a Swiss army knife. He just pulls that knife out and he just says, okay, pain, 
I'm not the author of it, but I'm the publisher of it, and I'm going to use it for some good in his or her life. It, the pain isn't good, but the purpose is good. And for some of you right now, God has pulled out his Swiss army knife, and he is using pain and suffering, loss and worse, sickness, financial setback, and he's using it like a Swiss army knife, and he's bringing about purpose in your life. If there's one thing that you can fall to your knees on and say, Lord, I hate what I am having to go through, but I trust, I trust you that you're doing something in my life. You're doing something in my kid's life. I hate it so much, but I trust you, and I'm thankful that you haven't given up on me. Man, you, you cry out to him in that moment. This isn't bumper sticker theology. This is the word of God. He takes the all things and he works them together for good. This is called God's providence. He's not just powerful over the all things. He's purposeful in the all things. He's driving it somewhere. His eternal decree, as Paul says in Ephesians 1, is being played out before our lives. And I want to I argue before you this morning is that I believe God's providence is God's single greatest miracle there is. When you think about it, it's, it's greater than all of the miracles in the Bible. When God did a miracle, when they walked on water and healed the, the sick and made the, uh, the paralytic walk, all of these things, that's great. What did God do? He intervened into fixed natural law and he changed it. Providence is so far above that in that what does God do? Not only does he maybe reach into fixed natural law, but he takes the free will of man and he still brings about his purpose with man's free will. This is a massive miracle of God that he can give somebody free will and make free will decisions and choices. And that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Pastor Todd moves the checker this way or that way. I still get him to where I want. It's a massive miracle of God. God's providence is his management of both fixed natural law and man's variable will. He's bringing, he's bringing it together for good. Which you know me, that leads to another question. Not only why do I give him thanks, well, he has a purpose. What's his purpose? His purpose is to work things together for good. So then the question becomes, what's the good? Right? Well, Paul goes on. He says, he says, now watch this. For those who are called according to his what? Purpose. His purpose. What's the good he's working out? He's working out his purpose in my life. Which only leads me to another question. I now know the good is the purpose. So now the question becomes, what's the purpose, God? You're like, how much longer is he going to ask questions? <laughs> when you don't know the answer in Scripture, what do you do? You keep reading. You keep reading. Verse 29. What's the purpose, Paul? Here it is. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be, purpose clause, conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Stop there. What is the purpose? The purpose is very clear. God's taking the all things in your life, my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He's bringing about, he's bringing about the good in my life. What's the good in my life? It's God's purpose in my life. What is God's purpose in my life? It's simply this, to be conformed to the very image of his son. In fact, Jesus is referred to as our big brother. Notice the end of verse 29. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And Jesus is like our big brother. You know why? You know why? Because our big, bro our big brother knows how to please God. There's two times that God parted the clouds 
And he made a statement about his son twice, and it was the same statement. He parted the clouds two times and said, this is my son in whom I am well, what? Pleased. Pleased. Why do we follow our big brother? Why are we followers of Jesus Christ? Because he knows how to please the father, and the father even told us he knows how to please the father. What is God doing in this crushing pain of mine? I, I, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. Let's not, let's not be plastic Christians. It's horrible. It's crushing. But he, he has a purpose, and apparently somehow, some way, I, I and those around me, those that I love, are going to be, they're going to be conformed to the image of Christ through this. I don't know how. I don't know how. But he's promised to do that. So why do I give thanks? Notice, notice what the verses said. This is incre- incredible because this may be the only thing you can be thankful for. We've had families in this church bury kids. Parents don't bury kids. I said five widows, 60 days. What in the world would we give thanks for? When you get right down to it, it's this verse. What is it? All I can be thankful for is the fact that God foreknew me, God predestined you, God is conforming you, God called you, God justified you. Someday God will glorify you. Someday he will glorify you. It's crushing. It's crushing. But I know that I'm being conformed for a purpose. The worst pain in life is purposeless pain. And God says, give thanks. Not for the circumstances. Give thanks in the circumstances for the fact that I'm bringing about purpose. And loved ones, with every eye up here for a moment, I want you to hear this. God has no accidents, and he never makes a mistake. He never makes a mistake. The story is told of a Persian rug maker. I was told this story by Dr. Fred Barshaw years ago. He tells the story of a Persian rug maker. And this Persian rug maker had the um, incredible skill of making these rugs. He was known around the world for his rug making. And the way this uh, gentleman would make his rugs is he would sit as the master rug maker uh, in this chair with a wooden frame in front of him. And in this wooden frame, there was no drawing or diagram. The, The design was in his mind. He's the master rug maker. And he had all of these taut strings that would be used to be weaved with thread And he had all of his servants for every color under the rainbow at his disposal. And the way he would make this rug is he had this design in mind and he began to call out the colors. And a servant would take the color that was called out and insert it and weave it through. He would take, uh, the master rug maker would say blue. The servant would grab blue and weave it through. Red, and the servant would take red, weave it through. And purple, another servant grabs purple, weaves it through. And the speed and the scurry in which he did this because he was a master rug maker Sometimes he would call out for green to be inserted, but yellow was inserted. Sometimes he would call out for red to be inserted, but blue would be inserted. But the master rug maker never, never called for the removal of the wrong thread. Rather, the master rug maker, who had this beautiful picture in mind, he would weave that color into his overall design. There was no mistakes. It was his design. You may be sitting here this morning feeling like green has been inserted into your life and you knew it was supposed to be red. God is providential and he will take that pain and suffering, that green thread, and he will bring about good, his purpose, which is to conform you to the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your um, providential hand. It, it's amazing to know we have a God who is all powerful. It's, it's mind boggling to know that we have a God that is all purposeful. You don't, you don't erase the hard things in our life. You redeem them and you bring about purpose with them. Father, we sit on the precipice of thanksgiving and we're going we're gonna to seek to be thankful for the all things. Even if that means we are thankful for the fact that you called us, you foreknew us, you justified us, you redeemed us, and you someday will glorify us. That's more than enough to be thankful for. So, Father, do your work in us this Thanksgiving. This morning, with your heads bowed, we come, we come to a providential moment, and that's the, the Lord's Supper. If there's anything that screams God's providential hand, it's the crucifixion and burial of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The circumstances were horrendous, awful. Man would take the life of God's only begotten son. But Father, out of that providential moment, you turned it around and made it the greatest victory that the world has ever seen. You do work all things together for good. And so this morning, if you're here and you're a Christ follower, we invite you to partake with us. If, you, if you've never given your life to Christ, I mean, you can do that now in your own seat, in your own words. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and then partake. If you're just not there yet, we're just so glad you're here. So just hang out and absorb the rest of the service. But for those that are Christ followers here this morning, it's our time to stop and to remember God's saving purpose through his son, Jesus Christ. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he, he was with his disciples and he said, um, this is my body as he broke this bread, which will be given for you tomorrow. And then he poured out the wine and he says, this represents my blood, which will be shed for you tomorrow. You know, what's interesting is that Paul describes that in 1 Corinthians, and it says just before he handed out the bread and the wine, it says that he gave thanks. He used that Greek word, eucharisteo. So communion for us is a point in time to give thanks and to remember. So uh, if you don't have the supplies, uh, they're on the tables here in this room. You can get up during the worship time and just grab some, take them back to your seat. And then if everybody in their own time, in their own way, whenever you're ready, after you've spent some time with the Lord, you just partake and the worship team will lead us in worship and close the service. But now it's your time with your Savior.
a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath their flood lose all their guilt they stains lose all their guilty stains lose all
Amen. What an awesome moment to be able to celebrate what Christ did, that finished work on the cross, changing our lives forever, changing history forever. I hope that our hearts are full of thanksgiving this morning. I hope that we go in thanksgiving and praise to our Lord Jesus all week long. And if it's your first time with us here at Crossroads, we just invite you, visit our starting point out there in the lobby. It's a great place to get connected here and learn more about our church. If you're in need of prayer this morning, we have prayer counselors down here at the front who would love to meet with you and talk with you to pray for you this morning. And uh, this is our uh, care offering morning. So our ushers will be at the um, exits at the, at the rear here with baskets. And um, this allows us to just give um, out of our hearts and give uh, monetarily to those who are in need this morning. This allows our elders to take care of our congregation, the people who are financially hurting. Where you are loved this morning, Crossroads, we're praying for you guys. And we uh, just ask that you walk in faith, walk worthy this week. We'll see you next week.